come in. You did some time. You didn't have to listen to me. Um, Natasha Baker is here. Uh, she came down from San Francisco. She's the CEO and founder of SNAP EDA. Um, she's an electrical engineer and founder of SNAP EDA, a Silicon Valley startup uh, helping engineers to design electronics faster. She started working on PCB design tools and libraries 13 years ago at National Instruments. She worked in software development. Later on, product marketing for their PCB design and simulation platform. She received her engineering degree from the University of Toronto with a focus on analog electronics. Uh, Snap EDA is a free search engine for electronics, data, electric symbols, footprints, and 3D models used by over a million professional engineers. Natasha is passionate about electronics and data because she believes it will enable faster innovation in the world. And uh, she spoke uh, recently at the uh, in Silicon Valley chapter of the Design Council. So I get uh, get Natasha up here, and I'll get, turn the mic over to her. Hopefully, we won't have much trouble with you. So. Oh, 
designing your uh, schematic, there's obviously the symbols. Um, if you're simulating it, the simulation models, the spikes, the ice models, as you run a TCD layout, the footprints. Um, if you're integrating with mechanical, the 3D models. So libraries are very vast. There's challenges at every stage um, with high quality libraries. Um, I want to focus today on just the symbols and footprints. Um, probably more depth on the footprint side, uh, but there's certainly challenges at every stage of the design process. So why do high quality libraries matter? Well, the number one reason, as everyone knows, is for proper manufacturing. If you have things um, defined incorrectly, obviously it's not gonna manufacture properly, so that's the number one reason that we need to make sure that libraries are very well defined, they're very precise, um, and all that kind of stuff. The other reason that sometimes people overlook is also to an more CAD tool to function correctly. Because if you don't have your courtyard defined properly, um, then your, uh, your design rule checks aren't gonna function properly. If you don't have your pin type set correctly, then your ERC checks, your electrical rule checks aren't gonna function correctly. Um, this is something that if, if engineers are making their own libraries, sometimes they overlook that. Um, <coughs> you know, being that you guys are from big companies and happen to have librarians, you're very lucky that, um, that they're probably enforcing all of these best practices. But it's something that we see when people are making their own libraries that sometimes they overlook. Uh, and then finally, for documentation, so to ensure readability and consistency uh, throughout your designs. The reason that libraries are so hard to get right is for several different reasons. Uh, first of all, it's an extremely detail-oriented process. Uh, for every pin uh, in your you know, schematic symbol or on your cart, there's all types of metadata that it um, For every pad, you, know, you have to be careful with the dimensions. Um, you know, even when it comes to things like your silk screen, silk screen width, some companies have their own standards around these types of elements as well. So there's a lot of different, there's a lot of details that engineers need to watch when they're creating their footprints. Um, the second is lack of data sheet consistency and standards. So as you guys have probably seen, um, component vendors won't always be consistent in how they make their data sheets. There won't be consistency across different component vendors. Um, and sometimes, the uh, data sheets are actually, like, because they're all in PDF, it's hard to extract the data in a way that's systematic or programmatic. So that makes it challenging as well. Um, lack of industry standards. So there's a lot of great industry standards for things like footprints, but, and even for symbols. But for things like integrated circuits, um, there's not really standards around how to create your schematic symbols. So some people have preferences, like they wanna have you know, their inputs on the left, they're open from the right, they're power on the top and bottom. Um, other people are like, no, I just want my symbol to look like the chip, um, you know, the physical chip. So people have different preference, preferences around these things, and it makes it difficult to, um, you know, standardiz standardization is so important, and so it can make it difficult to get that standardization and consistency. Um, the other is varying manufacturing capabilities. Your PCD manufacturer might not be able to manufacture, um, you know, the, at the, um, the level of tolerances that you need, you need for example. Uh, number five, this is actually a really big one, and this is, this points to why more component vendors don't provide libraries, um, because you would think, well, they're selling the chip, you know, they must be able to provide the footprint, um, but one of the biggest challenges there is that because every single EDA tool has a different file format, that means that it is a massive, massive challenge for component vendors to be able to support every single CAD tool. Um, and even though some CAD tools allow like import other file formats, a lot of the time they're not super accurate and it's not their fault, it's because of all the details. Um, but this can cause like a de de degradation of the library when you're importing them. So that's one of the reasons why companies like SnapDA really exist. Um, it's because the lack of universal file format means that for component vendors, it's just too daunting. And if a new version of you know, your PDA tool comes out, um, it's not always, usually it's backwards compatible, but not forward compatible. Um, and so anyway, there can be issues with, depending on the version that you use, um, there can be issues with using a library that's from a component vendor. And then finally, I would definitely say that design gets a lot of the focus. Um, for designers, they really think about um, you know, the, the design, and we really care about libraries from the, from the perspective of, I would say, um, 
we know how important it is to high quality, but I feel like a lot of time people are focused more on the design and libraries get a little bit less focus unless you're privileged enough to work at a really big company. So coming from the sense of a smaller company, we work with, we have a lot of bigger companies and a lot of smaller companies that use our software, and a lot of smaller companies tend to think, well, the value's in the design. The libraries don't matter until they get burned. And then they start learning, oh, wait a second, this is why big companies have librarians, it's because libraries are so important. So, as, it, as everyone knows, IPC is definitely um, doing an amazing job with the footprint standards. Um, the new IPC 7351C, I've seen some of the changes that are coming out in that, and they are awesome. Like, they really address a lot of the um, I, I think the open areas in the IPC 7351B. Um, by the way, are you guys, um, is anyone on the committee for the IPC 7351C at all, or B? Okay, I'm just curious. Um, so yeah, so IPC, we follow that at Snappy Day. Um, it's great. Uh, the new version coming out pretty soon. Um, and then for symbols, so the IEEE 315, uh, we follow that for schematic symbols. So that covers kind of the, you know, typical transistors and relays and all this kind of stuff. Um, again, it doesn't cover everything though. So with both of these standards, um, they don't cover everything and that's where the ambiguity sets in. So taking a look at the scope of libraries, um, there's over 300 million electronic components out there in uh, the world. And so if you think about that, <laughs> there's a pretty good chance that you're not going to be able to find the similar footprint that you need for your design. So just looking at the scope, this is a, a massive, massive challenge. Um, and again, many details required for every single element on your footprint, on your symbol, for it to you know, manufacture and function properly. Um, industry standards change, so that makes it complicated as well. So for example, um, the IPC 7351B has certain uh, standards that they set, and a lot of those are changing in 7351C. So that means a lot of companies need to upgrade their libraries or just decide to standardize an older version. Um, actually, I'm curious from the libraries, do you guys follow IPC in the libraries? Yes. Okay. And are you guys, do you already use the C, or you do? Okay. Because the C hasn't officially been released. So. Oh, yeah, I don't know that. Oh, you use both? Oh, okay. So you you made your own standard for the hybrid. As you guys probably know then, with C, there's a bunch of changes like the courtyards. Mm -hmm. So, which actually, I think a lot of engineers like better, right? Because it saves space on the board. Um, but yeah, so, you know, B would have just a standard expansion beyond the outline. And then with C, there's contour courtyards, which follow the, like, the pads or the outline of the curve more closely. Um, but that's like an, an example. And that was a little bit more, I would say, trivial, but then there's more major changes, like the location of the, the um, the zero component orientation, right? Yeah. So, and that's major, right? Because now, it's like, so, you have to go and manually change all of them? Like, it's, <laughs> is it a lot, it's, I imagine it's a lot of work, or? Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, what yeah. we used to, like, have to remain top of line, so. Yeah. We're probably going to leave that one, wherever, wherever. And that's like a perfect, that's like a perfect example of something I'm going to talk about in a second, which is, this is an example where the standards are in conflict with kind of the community, um, the community's preferences. And so in some cases, I, I mean, I'm, there must be some justification, <laughs> but yes, in, in, some, in some of these cases, the companies will just override the standards. But then what happens is for companies that don't have librarians, right, who, who can really think about these things and define these things really well, they get into a position where they're like, well, I don't even know where to start. Because how, you know, how are they supposed to know that? They don't have that knowledge. Um, so, so yeah, uh, so company specific standards, and that's if, if your, uh, your company is creating your own li libraries, actually every single company should have company <laughs> specific standards. Imagine that everyone in this room does when creating libraries, and some kind of a leak process. Okay. Uh, infinite user preferences, so I mentioned before, some people how they want their pins, pins configured. There could be things about you know silkscreen width or how components are broken up into different sections. There's a lot of details when it comes to user preferences, um, and we do our best to kind of capture those, uh, especially when it comes to well, just with every tool. There's just so many preferences. 
Um, application specific requirements, so depending on how your design is laid out, that can affect your footprints as well. And finally, tool specific perks. So to give you an example, some tools, and you know, they're typically more of the less of the hiring tools, but they can handle the concept of one single pin mapped to multiple footprint pins, whereas most hiring tools don't handle that concept. And but some people really like that. And so kind of managing those two preferences um, in libraries is really challenging. So before I jump into all the errors, I want to preface this by saying that I'm not going to go into the, um, <laughs> do you guys agree with this? <laughs> so, um, yes, I, you know, one of the things about PCB libraries is they bring out so much passion from engineers and I think that's awesome. <laughs> and I think it's a healthy kind of passion because it sparks debate. Um, so, so yeah, but what I want to say is I'm not going to go through kind of, you know, I'm not going to tell you guys how to make your libraries. There's people in the room that are better than me at making libraries, I'm sure. So I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty details. What I want to talk about is more from the perspective <laughs> of what are the common errors that we're seeing that are very common amongst both new engineers but also professional engineers who make libraries often, but these are issues that are very easy to overlook. So that's where I'm going to focus, less on the preferences. Um, but if anyone has, you know, if anyone has things they disagree with or that um, they want to bring up as something that they think should really be a standard, I would love to hear it because it's, it's always awesome to hear that kind of stuff. So let's start with the very basics. This is probably going to be super elementary for um, most people in the room, but we'll start with the very, very basics, and then we'll go through to some of the more complex ones. And again, I would love to hear from you guys. If you have anecdotes, if I'm missing anything, I think that's going to be awesome for everybody. Okay, so this is the most basic one. Every kind of new engineer at university or college, um, they know this one, and this is basically that you need to make sure that when you are creating your, you know, you're doing the mappings which are your symbols and footprints that you basically triple check your mappings. Um, I don't see this one very often amongst professional engineers because I think everyone's been trained to triple check this kind of stuff, but we still see it um, and it's one that I thought I'd point out really briefly. Second one is uh, pad of engineers. So this usually happens if you have like a custom pad on your board um, and Drawing it manually can be you know, difficult because if you get it off, you can buy a fraction of you know, a millimeter. It can cause issues with, uh, with the solder marks. So this is definitely something that very basic, but we still do see this. We don't see it as much from professionals. They tend to know to triple check this, but you know, this is obviously one of the basics. So here's an example. Um, this is one that our team made pretty recently. It has over 3,000 pins. And so you can imagine, you know, just imagine both the, you know, making sure the pin position is accurate, but also just extracting that data from the data sheet. If you think about it, I think it gave like a, maybe a grid of XY coordinates. And so if you can just imagine. So just extracting that data from the data sheet. If you think about it, I think it gave like a, maybe a grid of XY coordinates. And so if you can just imagine Extracting all, the, extracting all that data, and then making sure that each pin is positioned correctly. And not only that, but it's a super weird pattern. It's not even symmetrical, so it makes it even you know, more difficult. And then on top of that, mapping to over 3,000 pins. So you can just imagine how, you know, like the past two examples were very simple, but just imagine the level of attention to detail that would have to go into something like that. So this is another super basic one, um, but we saw this one recently. Uh, in this case, what happened was an engineer was converting uh, from imperial to metric, and they rounded off to the hundredth of a millimeter. And as a result, uh, it got flagged by the PCB manufacturer. Luckily, they caught it before manufacturing. Um, definitely a newbie mistake, um, but the lesson here is don't round, <laughs> because um, that can you know, cause issues. Um, and cause delays. So, another super basic one um, is just making sure that there's clearance between your silk screen and any exposed copper um, to ensure good solder joints. Um, so, 
you just need to make sure, I think, I think it's 0.25 millimeters of clearance between the, um, the copper and the, and the silk screen, um, and I believe the ITC covers that in their standard. <coughs> Uh, so, another very basic <laughs> issue uh, is you know, a lot of the upcoming issues I'm going to talk about have to deal with data sheet interpretation. Uh, but here's another very basic one where an engineer was looking at a connector and they misinterpreted the vertical header as a right angle header. And what happened is that this then changed the interpretation of where the component outline was supposed to go. And that doesn't seem like such a big issue at first, but it actually is a really big issue because it obviously affects the courtyards, the um, clearance in between the components. And so definitely something um, to keep an eye on is just make, making sure that every component is interpre interpreted properly. So this is another common error, which is misinterpreting time sequence. You see this one? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> So yeah, it's another very common issue, especially with connectors that can have weird pin numbering or you know esoteric ways of doing it. Um, yes, this is a pretty common issue and a pretty gnarly one that is not fun to deal with. So always making sure, again, that <laughs> the sequence is shown as on the data sheet is, um, is good. <laughs> and there's something related I'm going to talk about in just a second to this one too. Yeah? Something that can help. <coughs> Repeat her question so the audience can hear. I couldn't hear. Um, so actually, she gave amazing feedback. Maybe I'll let you. Do you want to share it with the group? Or? Okay. So she was saying that when you're making a connector, make sure to make the mate at the same time because that way it'll be interpreted the same way. And even if there was an error, it'll still connect properly. Is that right? Yeah. So I think that's awesome feedback. And um, and yeah, that's that's a great approach. Yeah. Okay. So now let's go on to the more complex ones. And uh, again, I'm really looking forward to having feedback tips and things like that. <clears throat> so this one is my favorite, yet least favorite. <laughs> this one is, do you guys see this one a lot? Bottom view. Yes. Not this. And they don't tell you. <laughs> so most of the time in the data sheets, they'll show the top view of the land pad or the, you know, the footprint or the component. Um, but every once in a while, they'll just trip it up a little bit just to keep you on your toes, and they'll show um, the bottom view. So in this case, you know, this is actually the bottom view, which means that, like, you have to imagine it like flipped that way, right? It's going to be on the board. Uh, and this error we see a lot, even from people that know to avoid this error. Just because sometimes the data sheet, sometimes the data sheets actually won't mark it, or sometimes it'll be very difficult to interpret. You get lost and it was wrong when you marked it wrong. Oh, okay. So <laughs> she's getting marked things wrong. Yeah. So this is a big one, and yeah. Well, one thing you have to watch out for too is that on the flip chips that we had before, some of the manufacturers actually do have the flip, so you have the uh, Excel spreadsheet. You have to know very. So yeah, so the way that people typically resolve this issue is kind of similar to what you mentioned, well, somewhat, is sometimes to salvage their board, people will try to bend their leads. I don't know if anyone's ever tried that before, which could maybe work if it was like a through hole component if you don't break the, the lead. Um, but I've heard of, like, someone I know made this mistake, and he is like a very experienced like engineer. And I think, yeah, I think he told me they like bent the leads and like soldered it upside down. <laughs> and I think it worked like for the prototype, but not fun when you're spending a lot of money on, you know, manufacturing. Suddenly you're on a tight deadline. So the second one is just general misinterpretation of complex data sheets. 
So in this case, um, this simple drawing here, um, <laughs> uh, basically what happened was um, this, so, okay, so this dimension was interpreted, but they should have been interpreting this dimension as the distance between the, um, uh, like, for the dimensions, to get the dimensioning properly. Um, so yeah, so a lot of errors just happen because of the way that it's data is extracted. I don't know if you guys have seen that as well. Um, so what we typically do is we'll always have a second engineer verifying how that data was extracted uh, because that's really the, one of the biggest uh, points of failure in making good quality footprints. Uh, do you guys, I'm curious, do you guys have like a second engineer that will typically verify <coughs> extraction of data? Okay. So the third one is the wrong uh, centroid. So um, the centroid should be at the center of mass of the component. Uh, and if they're off, they can cause like delays or more expense with your um, with the uh, assembly process. So this is an error that we see pretty often as well. Um, wrong component, component zero orientation. Again, uh, for the pig and plate machine to work properly, it's important for it to be oriented. Um, now this is changing, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but it should be top left for IPC 7351B. And then for C, it should be, I believe, bottom left. Um, but I think there's two, two levels of C, or, yeah. I'm not totally familiar with C at this point. Um, we, haven't, we haven't adapted to C yet just because um, we're waiting until it gets formally released, but there's some things that we've adopted, like the contour courtyards, and I like what they did with the, um, Thermal pad, because that with the naming it never accounted for the thermal pad before in the footprint names, so that was probably a little improvement. Okay, improper pin definition, so not properly marking your power pins as power, uh, your inputs as input, your outputs to out, as output. This seems trivial. It seems like it's not that important, but it's very important um, for your electrical rule checking. Did you want to add something? Oh, okay. Okay, so here's another one, and this really again comes down to data sheet interpretation. So in this case, what happened is that there's a data sheet that says, oh, to get the whole size, you want to go to node four. So it says that somewhere, somewhere on there. It says go to node four. And then okay, so you go to node four, which is a totally different file, like totally different PDF file, and you go there, it takes you like five minutes to find it, and you finally get it, and you go there, and then you get this like you know, complex drawing, and again, um, you know, you want the you want the full size, but you want it before plating or after plating? Well, you want it after plating, right? You want to finish? Yeah, exactly. So, um, in this case, what happened was the engineer misinterpreted, um, you know, the extraction of the data. Once again, a lot of it comes down to that extraction of data, um, and they took the unfinished hole before plating, and as a result. It's really difficult to make the hole smaller. I think you can like add more copper plating into the hole to try to bring down the, you know, the size, but it's very difficult. And there's some other techniques, but. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Did you want to? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. So this one comes courtesy of um, screaming circuits. Uh, and this is, I have another, I asked them a question, so that's where it came from, and they kind of recommended this to me. Um, and so, uh, I don't know if anyone has seen this before, but the earlier IPC standards, I'm not sure if the newer ones do, but they didn't take into account um, that you can't just, for the thermal pads, you can't just have solder uh, paste applied like over the whole thing. It needs to um, be broken into sections. For, and so you need to have, make sure your solder mask um, is broken into a pattern. So because what would happen before is that if you didn't break it up, um, you would get this case where the component would float on top because the solder paste was too thick, and then it, the connections to the pins wouldn't form like that. I know we break it up, but I don't, I have to have our engineer how we break it up. We usually just try to use set, like somewhere around 70%. 70%? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll look into that because I'm actually really curious. Okay. Yeah. Okay, 
Yeah. Okay. Yes, if I can do the pasting on that, then we use you and use one of the window panes. Yeah. Yes. The other approach is to do an X in the middle so that you have no case printed in that X. And actually, I've compared both. And because that X creates a channel for the flux to outgas underneath the part, I've actually found that that actually works the best. Interesting. Are you an assembly house? I am a uh, hands-on manufacturing and Okay, awesome. So we do service design, board layout, but I've worked a lot. I came from manufacturing and worked in manufacturing. That's very cool. Well, I'm, I'm very curious about the X because it's not something I've seen a lot, but I'm like, I'm gonna have to look into that now. That, yeah, that's yeah. amazing. So, okay. So yeah, it's a couple different methods, but basically just make sure it's not just one whole big giant pad of solid waste. So, okay, the last presentation that I did, I gave, I gave two presentations um, on a very similar topic like a month ago, and in both presentations, um, people asked me the same question. And that question was, do assembly shops handle footprint differently? Do I need to make my footprint differently depending on which assembly shop I use? Um, so I asked this question to Rural Circuits. They are a big company manufacturer here in California. They're, well, they're close to they're where I am in Silicon Valley. Uh, and they're affiliated with the advanced facility as well. And so I asked them, and they said a lot of the prototype um, manufacturers and assembly houses have very similar equipment. And so it is, there's less variance needed in your footprints between different assembly houses. So for rural circuits, um, you don't need to customize your footprints depending on which assembly house you go to. Uh, and so I think that's really great news. Um, the other person I asked is Wayne Benson from Screening Circuits. And uh, I asked him the exact same question, and he told me the exact same thing, uh, which is basically that you know you need to have good footprints if you're uh, doing low volume manufacturing. They need to be good. Um, he said they will typically check them for issues like I mentioned the QFN issue that he mentioned as well. Um, he said that when you go into higher volume um, manufacturing assembly, he said that your uh, you know what happens behind the scenes. Maybe you guys have more knowledge on this than I do, but he said that a lot of the times they remake the footprints. The customer doesn't even know about it. So the customer releases an IPC footprint for you know the prototyping process and then they release that to manufacturing. But a lot of the time during the NPI process, the uh, manufacturing engineers will totally redo the footprints without your knowledge <laughs> to optimize yield. Um, so so I think that kind of answers our question, which is the way that we're creating footprints doesn't need to vary between assembly houses because even when it does at high volume, they're going to do that for you. Um, so hopefully that answers it a little bit. Okay, so now I would like to talk a little bit about verification. And uh, before we move into verification and checklists and all that kind of stuff, I'm curious uh, to know, does anyone here, well, does, that, does everyone here have a, like, like a release process to get a new library into your your libraries, basically a new footprint into your libraries, yes? Okay. And do you guys use like software from like the EDA tool? Like do they have software that you use to do that, to manage that, or do you have your own workflows? Sometimes you run it through like a ladder to check all the different sources. Mm -hmm. Clippers. Yep. Okay. And do you guys have your own like checklist and process outside of the tools that you use too? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So okay, I'm excited to hear your okay. guys' contribution to your team. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Regardless of where you get a library, like it doesn't matter if you got it from a component vendor that's like, you know, right on the website, or where you got it from, you know, a third party library. Yeah. Doesn't matter where you got it from, you need to verify your libraries. Where you created it, you need to verify them. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, you know, formats change, and that means the <coughs> language will change, uh, the import could change. So it's really important to go through a thorough verification process just to prevent any surprises when you go into manufacturing. Um, a lot of the time people think, well, I'll just go to the component vendor website, it's gonna be awesome. Um, but sometimes, like, they're not really experts necessarily in making footprints, so you can get the dimensions, they'll have them in the data sheets. Um, the libraries are not, not always great, usually they're pretty good, but you need to verify them. 
So we go through like a three-step process and what I recommend to companies, which you know, I'm sure that everyone here in the room is from a big company. Um, I know that you guys probably go through a very little process. Uh, what we do is we create, we have, we have basically three different stages of ours. Uh, the first one is during the, the purchase creation process, we have very thorough and comprehensive checklists uh, where we go through like every single element um, that we need to be aware of um, with a big focus on things like double check there's no mirrored <laughs> issues, you know, mirrored components in the data sheet, things like that. Um, the second step is we have a second engineer who will go through follow a very similar checklist, there's some variance to it, um, but in general it's very similar and they will also verify everything <coughs> in detail because there's just so many details and it's easy for people to miss on the first pass. Um, and then finally we have automated verification that we also have um, and with automation is obviously the best way to solve as many problems as you can. Um, and that will look at uh, things that can be automated. So we can't, you know, at least at this point, with the level of AI out there, we can't automate the extraction <coughs> of you know very complex connectors like I showed you earlier. At least not yet. Maybe the tools out there will get better. Um, but what we can automate is things like um, you know is this pin properly categorized based on you know our knowledge of how pins should be categorized, um, or um, you know if I know that an SOIC you know footprint always has a pitch of 1.27 millimeters and it's 1.26 millimeters we can fly that right so these are the types of things that we do automate um, because it's just hard to do this without any automation do you guys use some automation as well no um, so yeah so this is just an example of some of our kind of more simpler checklists and what we do is we integrate this right into our project management system um, and also during the uh, upload process so that people need to go through the process of checking off every single detail. Um, now, one of the things I would say about uh, library like release processes is one of the hardest parts of doing it is actually enforcing it because it's really easy to get together and be like, oh yeah, let's make these checklists, right? And let's have this whole process. But it's really difficult when you're on a tight deadline to actually be patient and actually go through each little bit. Um, and so anytime we've been burned, it's usually because someone's in a huge rush, they're on a tight deadline, and they aren't following our checklist. So anything that you guys can do to incorporate um, the checklist within your process so that people need to go through that process to get to the next step uh, is going to make sure that people um, actually do it, which is, again, one of the hardest parts. Um, the other thing that we do on our team, and that obviously, if you guys are always looking to keep improving your library creation process, which at our company, we are definitely trying to do that all the time, um, is we, every single week, we look at every issue that the verifier found, um, the engineer that was verifying the complaints. What did they find? Why did it happen? Is it a real issue, or is it like, is this an opportunity to make our library process better by having a debate internally? Um, or, and if it is an error, can we automate it out of the, automate it somehow? Um, like if someone used, uh, let's see, can we do this here? Yeah, so someone used a, a gap between copper and silicon less than 0.25 millimeters. So we actually have an automated check for that. Um, so, but these are the types of things that we start questioning and we think about, okay, how can we improve our verification process and more creation process and automation process so that these things don't happen again. Uh, and then, like I said before, automation. So there's a bunch of things that we are always looking to automate more. We're doing a little experiment right now with some machine learning um, to automate uh, some pin types and extraction of pin types. So really excited about that one. <laughs> Um, and, and also to make the process faster too, because if we can auto-categorize pin types, well then that just saves our engineering team time so that they can focus more on some of the um, more complex aspects. So this is an example. We actually um, built uh, an automated verification system and um, what it does is it looks at basically all of the industry standards out there. It looks at data queries, because those are harder to do anything automated with. Um, but it looks at things like, for example, um, if this is a 
uh, standard JEDEC SOIC package, we know what the pitch should be. Um, and if, if we're getting you know, some data from a component vendor that's saying something else, then we flag it as a potential error. Uh, so basically the whole idea is that we can take data from all over the industry to properly figure out, first of all, is this footprint made correctly, but also is their data even correct? Um, one quick example of this is we were working with a component vendor to um, automate a lot of their different headers, because headers are obviously a nice candidate to automate because they're more, you know, at least some of them are um, more simple. And one of the things that was out was because it was saying that a um, particular header was two rows but only had nine pins in total. So then on the next row it would say, oh, this is a two pin connector with 18 pins in total, which obviously makes sense. So we found out, okay, this data is wrong, we can't trust this data. And that's an easy example because obviously 9 divided by 2 doesn't really work out, 4.5 pins per row. Um, but if they had made that mistake on something like an 18 pin connector where there are, you know, there could be 9 pins per row, that's an easy mistake to miss. So what we did is we made this system where we now um, not only look at the component vendor data, um, using our system, we look at the data from a bunch of different places to see, is does this make sense? So, you know, working with different distributors and working with automated person and data sheets, we take a look at, is there any other way that we can figure out a better sense of what the actual actual number of total pins is, weigh all that data together, and then flag and skip parts that don't aren't consistent in all aspects of data. Not yet, but that's a great idea. That's where I find a lot of those. They're bringing the stem file. It's different. Yeah, it's different yeah. you know there's something wrong. Yeah, for sure. And that's that's a great, like that's a great area that we definitely want to go next. Um, and it's something we um, we hear a lot that the step file is just such a great way to verify as well. So this is something that we keep developing and I'll show you in just a second what that looks like on the website. Okay. Before we go further, I'm curious, um, did I miss anything? Does anyone have any other things they wanted to share, areas where they've been working with footprints, or maybe tips to share on how well, you know, other companies here could improve their processes? Could you talk about the uh, footprint gaming conventions? Yes. <laughs> well, we use, we use the items of footprint gaming conventions. Um, so we'll pull all of that just as it's shown. However, we've had to adapt it a bit before the C was released. For things like I mentioned with the time, we had to actually like make our own standard because there wasn't a standard until now. Um, and then there's some variants where like uh, sometimes the component category won't be represented. So I think they have like the category underscore for connectors um, and other types of components that aren't standard packages. Um, it'll usually be the category of the sort of part name. Um, and so we'll be like the manufacturer of the part name. Um, but yeah, I'm curious, what do you think of the naming convention? Yeah. Do you see this slide? I'm going to come up with a hashtag. I'm going to do this. Wait, I'll just tell you. 
kind of seen as being like a surface mount rectangle. Mm -hmm. if, you, if, you don't, if you're not consistent with the height first and the length second, or vice versa, and you grab the same cat stack and put it in a cart, and then you load it in the board, and, you know, you could fall away. <laughs> yeah. So, how do you discover that? Oh. <laughs> and does, does IPC define the cat stack? Do they define having? I always thought it was the, um, the width first and then the length, I think, but mm -hmm. it, we were, we're doing it the opposite, I think. Because you can see. Next slide. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, as far as Jedek is concerned, there's um, Metro Graphics is actually host attached with it. It's 7 a.m. Pacific time on Tuesdays, and this guy named Michael Durkin, and he's working on doing the pack standardization for 3D modeling and, and other compliances. So yeah. Yeah, so that's, I think that's part of the GC11, right? The, yeah, it is. Yeah, but that's pretty, it's really amazing work that Michael, Michael Durkin is doing with that. Um, so it's, it's really exciting. Yeah, it is. Yeah, but that's pretty, it's really amazing work that Michael, Michael Durkin is doing with that. Um, so it's, it's really exciting. It's super challenging. So um, I'm excited to see, like, I'm excited to see that because I think that's going to help everyone in the industry. Yep. Uh, how much material is required to the PC? Houses mm -hmm. and some of my customers are getting into design, so the relatively small group of, of people that do that. Do you think um, your service would be targeting, you know, a small PC bound house that has design capabilities? Is this something that you'd be interested in? Because as I yeah. travel, you know, I'm trying to provide some sort of value, and if I can pass on, hey, this is where you go because we have these issues. Yeah, definitely. Our, our platform is completely free. Um, we'll go into it in just a second. Uh, it's completely free and it's used by everyone from small shops to literally all the top tech companies. Like the top five tech companies are all either users or customers of our platform. So yeah, but most of all, everything that we make for them goes into our free library as well. So our goal is to make everything, like I know this sounds weird, but we want to make it all free because we believe like me being a former engineer, I want to make sure that we make it all available to engineers. And then for no cost, I don't think engineers should have to pay for footprints. And then on the flip side, the way we make money is with component vendors and distributors. So yeah, I think, I mean, I'm really building what I would want as an engineer. So I try to make it, we try to make it as like open and great for engineers as we possibly can. And we're always trying to iterate and make it better. And so yeah, we, we really care about making it good for engineers. <laughs> so, okay. Before we kind of move into the last portion, um, is there anyone else that wanted to bring up anything? So real quick, I want to talk about some of the tools just that we have, just so you guys have a quick introduction to um, to what we do and what's available. So um, basically, Snap EDA, uh, it's a platform that provides symbols, footprints, and 3D models. We actually started introducing IBIS models and device models as well, um, but our focus is really on the symbols and footprints. Uh, we have a, a library of millions of components, and it supports um, all the various design tools in the market. So Allegro, WorkPad, Altium, Metro, Metro Graphics, um, we support pads, uh, PX Designer, and KiCad, Evo 6003, and we're always evaluating new ones as well, but that seems to cover the entire room here. Um, so we have a few different features on the site. So again, our entire library is completely free. Um, our goal is to make it free forever for engineers, um, and we have, we have a couple of cool features that I want to show. So this one is InstaBuild, and basically what this is, is to speed up the design of very simple integrated circuits. Um, and what you do is you highlight the data sheet for pinout, and then it automatically tries to categorize the pins. Um, so it'll detect it out as like an output. Um, and then from there, it automatically will make the symbol based on our standards, the, the way we typically do it on the website is the way we hear it about the most, which is maximum configuration of you know, inputs and outputs and array. Um, it'll automatically configure the symbol and it'll complete all the mappings based on extracting them from the table. So it's just a faster way to make a schematic symbol um, and it links it to an IPC compliant footprint. So we don't run this. This tool isn't available unless we have the footprint already available. And you can find it on, on the site by going to, to any product page you're looking for. Um, the other thing that we have as well is, and this is a super popular service, which is 
Um, if, if you uh, need like a verified footprint really quickly, we have a 24-hour service where you can just request it. Um, we make it in one of the standards unless you request it to have it made to the data sheet recommendations or if it's like a connector that will follow the data sheet recommendations um, for like a, some kind of complex footprint. So we don't run this. This tool isn't available unless you have the footprint already available. And you can find it on, on the site just by going to, to any product page you're looking for. Um, the other thing that we have as well is, and this is a super popular service, which is um, if, if you uh, need like a verified footprint really quickly, we have a 24 hour service where you can just request it. Um, we make the component to ICC standards, unless you request it to have it made to the data sheet recommendations, or if it's like a connector that will follow the data sheet recommendations um, for like a, some kind of complex connector. Um, and you'll get an email in 24 hours saying it's live, and then everyone going forward can also download that for free too. So you're helping the community. Uh, the other thing too is, this is what I was mentioning before about our verification. So this is our real-time verification checker, and it's very, very simple This, um, in the sense that the purpose of this is to not to test the footprint itself and manufacturability. That's really a better kind of tool for Valor to be taking on. What this does is it's actually looking at the data integrity. So it's the data integrity um, and then using that data um, integrity, validating that to determine whether or not the footprint was made correctly. So it's a little bit different in the sense that this is looking more at, you know, is the data integrity good? And then it runs through a few other kind of manufacturing checks as well. Now you can also upload, well, we don't support, I don't think we support um, cadence uploads or mentor uploads, but uh, for, I know we support Evo uploads, <laughs> and it'll run through your libraries in real time, so you can check them as well. Now, the final thing I wanted to mention too is that um, at SnapDA, our goal is to really build a community. We're kind of early in that, um, we have a lot of users. <laughs> Um, and I guess where we, where we think community can really help is flagging things that, you know, if there is an issue with how data was extracted um, or, or that kind of thing, what we allow people to do is everyone can fla uh, flag an issue on site really easily, report an issue, um, and then we'll get back to people after we investigate. Um, but the reason I think this is really important is because uh, libraries are so detailed and sometimes people even misinterpret you know, how a library is made, there could be multiple methods. So it gives that feedback loop and it allows engineers to see like this many other people use the footprint, I don't see any issues, it gives you that level of um, <coughs> transparency. So just to summarize here, uh, libraries are necessary for uh, reliable manufacturing, uh, readability and to uh, allow your tool function to, uh, to work properly, so your DRC and ERC checks. Uh, implementing verification checklists and processes is essential, but not just implementing them, but also enforcing them. So figuring out how you can incorporate that into your design flow uh, so that people can't move on to the next stage until you know, that's been validated. And then finally, there's other tools out there that can help increase efficiency and productivity. So, oh, and just to wrap it up, I would like to thank my code yeah, engineering team. Um, they know much more than me about libraries, and they uh, really help the presentation. So, even so this is our code engineering team. Yeah. And that's basically it. So, thank you guys so much for, for having Questions. me.
I've, I've used Snap before, but sometimes running the script, the batch file and everything to you for yeah. you know, I've had trouble. We've changed that. Yeah, so yeah, and they, just because of your exact feedback, um, we changed that, and so now we provide the native files. files. Oh, yeah. For, 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 most, for all the new ones that we've been making, we provide the DRA, and yeah, uh, because of the feedback that we've heard from engineers that sometimes their firewall block, blocks the batch file from running, or, you know, or like it needs certain configurations, and yeah, we change that. Yeah? More of a generic question. Uh, Fabricators, it's a manufacturer, they can assemble any. Yeah. You've got to screw, what's the terminology for the people that are assembled who want to put their points on, right? I mean, yeah. how do people generally use that word? I usually think of the fab as the like unit that makes the fabrication process go faster. Yeah. 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 You can say like Ford fabricator, like if you want to make a specification, like Ford fabricator and then assembly houses, that's what Ford would say, or the Ford manufacturer. The Ford manufacturer, he's saying that the Ford manufacturer is saying that the assembler? No, no, that's not. CM is a contract manufacturer. CM is like a manufacturer. So CM is a manufacturer. So CM is a manufacturer. So CM is like an umbrella term. Yeah. Yeah. That's what board manufacturers probably do for you.